Well, the Ebola case in the U.S. is raising more questions about the deadly virus in Canada. We've been asking viewers to send in their questions and concerns about Ebola. And Dr. Peter Lin, CBC's medical columnist, joins us now with some information. So, first off, you know, there hasn't been a diagnosed case in Canada yet. How concerned should Canadians be? Well, I think once it made it into the U.S., it became really close because we have so much travel going back and forth. And realistically, it could have been an airplane coming over here as well. And then somebody landed and we'd have the case here. So I think everybody is prepared for this, thinking it will happen at some point. But the good thing is that everybody has been sort of doing the SARS HI, uh, H1N1 thing. In other words, all the preparation has already been done and people are very well aware. And that's why sometimes you'll hear that we tested this person and he's negative. Mm -hmm. We like hearing that. It means that everybody's on edge, everybody's watching. And so if we get these negative tests, it means that we're catching people early. We're going to overcall things a little bit. Mm -hmm. And that way we're in a much safer position. That's exactly what I've been hearing. A lot of people feel it's just a matter of time. And as you said, there have been scares right. and people are on alert, which is good. Um, okay, so let's get to our questions from our viewers. First question we have here is that I know Ebola is not airborne, but what if someone sneezes or coughs and the drops of spit or mucus, I'm guessing they're saying, get into their mouth somehow. Is that, a, is that a concern or is that a way that it can be transmitted? Yes, so in that liquid, okay, there is the Ebola virus. And then the key thing is that it has to go through something, so through your eyes or through your mouth in terms of the mucous membrane or a cut. Now you don't breathe it in though, like the way we were talking about other cold viruses, because this virus can't get into your lung cells. So even if it gets into your lung cells, it's not useful, it can't get into the cell to make photocopies of itself. So that's why we call it non airborne, you have to touch something in terms of the body fluids. But you're absolutely right. If I sit here and I sneeze horrifically at you, some of the Ebola will be within the, the mucus uh, secretions, not so much coming from my lungs, but just inside my mouth, etc. So that's why they're trying to avoid all of that contact as well. All right, interesting. All right, another viewer asking, why are they putting people in quarantine in the U.S.? Why not just give them a blood test? Yeah, that's a good question. So it turns out the virus actually goes moving around looking for a place to set up. That's why the incubation period is so long, up to 21 days, because it's looking for a good factory. So once it gets into your cell, then it makes copies of itself. And then when the cells have made enough copies, the cell explodes. And then the virus now comes into the bloodstream. And that's when you start having the fever and those kinds of things. So until you have the symptoms, there's very very little of the virus floating around in your bloodstream. And so that's why instead what they say is we quarantine everybody for the 21 days and if they get sick anytime during that time they get blood tested and it, they're already isolated. Uh, if they don't have any symptoms then they're in the clear. So the blood test is not useful until they have symptoms. Yeah, the blood test is definitely sounds like not useful early on at Correct. all. All right, next question. Another viewer would like to know how long can the Ebola virus live on a surface? And this is probably referencing our coverage yesterday. We heard about decontamination of Thomas Duncan's apartment yesterday and removal of his mattress and sheets. So how long does that virus live on a surface? So on, let's say, doorknobs and things like that, it's a couple of hours, and you see them spraying oh. chlorine kind of that's stuff. That's right, you know, in going Africa. in with the hazmats. And chlorine really kills this thing, so that's why they're selling buckets of the chlorine and people are washing their hands in their chlorine and things like that. But if it's bodily fluid, so let's say blood, or let's say if somebody threw up and that's on the mattress, so in that kind of fluid, it could last for several days. And so that's why they were very careful in removing all of the mattresses and the towels and the sheets and everything else, because that might have bodily fluids on there. So on an inanimate object, it may not last very long, but in the bodily fluid kind of situation, it could last for several days. And that's why they wanted to get rid of that. And the best way to get rid of it is they're going to burn it all. Uh, because with heat, the Ebola virus will die. Even if you ate that bush meat, you know, that they keep talking about in West Africa, if it was cooked, the virus is dead. But then unfortunately, they might not have cooked it or they were touching it. And so mm -hmm. that's why they would have gotten the virus initially. Okay, last question. We're running out of time, but I really want to get this one in. Why did the patients flown to the U.S. live while so many in Africa, we're well over 3,000 now, have died? Uh, different healthcare system completely. So just for example, we have air conditioning here, whereas over there, there's nothing. We have all these intravenous fluids. We can support them with liquids. And we have just so much better healthcare here versus in West Africa, mm -hmm. where they're basically lying in these little sheds. So you can imagine that they don't even have enough gloves and that's why the spread there is such a horrific thing. So if we had the same system over there, I don't think we would have the same numbers of people right. and we would have a much better survival rate. And that's why you hear people coming back stateside and they're actually surviving and I think that's the main reason is the healthcare system is much better on this. And side. we keep hearing the system there is uh, uh, collapsing as and a result. And that's why we're yeah. sending people over there, right? So that's why mm -hmm. we're sending these mobile units and things and I think that will help. 
Uh, but definitely once we get that situation taken care of, then we'll have less of these flights and things like that to worry about in the rest of the world. That's a great point, and that's the CDC was saying that as well today. We need to stop it in West Africa. Dr. Lin, thank you for your insight and your time. Really remarkable. Great stuff. Thank you. Dr. Peter Lin is CBC's medical columnist.